Good morning and welcome to The Up Zone, where understanding politics is made simple. We are your two hosts, Mr. Elmer Floyd, former House Representative for the 43rd District in the state of North Carolina, and myself, Tisha S. Waddell, former City Councilwoman for the 3rd District in the city of Fayetteville. Good morning, Mr. Floyd. How are you? Good morning, Tish. How are you doing? I see that your glasses are still the same size. Yes, I need to be able to see what's on this screen. The writing is so teeny tiny. I got to put my readers on so I can see it. I hope you can. I can see it. I can see it just fine. <laughs> no problems over here. Mr. Floyd, what we got going on in this great city this week? Do you have on a, uh, Do you have an additional microphone turned on? Yes. Please turn it off because we got feedback. Okay. Okay. Tell me what tell me what we got going on this morning. Well, you know, we lost two of our Board of Education members. And that was Milton Yarborough, which will be funeralized tomorrow at John okay. Clark, John Wesley. And then we have Helen Farrell, which was a, also a board member. Her arrangement has not been made. And then uh, next week, Operation Sickle Cell is going to have a play at Christ, I guess it's Church of Christ, off of uh, Pamela Drive. Okay. Then to... Do you that, have the details for that? No, just, I think it's, it starts at 530. Okay. Uh, and then to the Martin Luther King Committee met with, the, well, the president uh, met with the city you know, as it relates to the Martin Luther King Park. So traction is now being made towards the development of the park. Because it's, Were you a part of that meeting, Mr. Floyd? Uh, I was, uh, I had a seat at the meeting. How did that meeting go? I think, I, I think that uh, it was a good understanding about the, the role that the city, had, you know, had designated their funds. And then there's a meeting also with the county board of commissioners. I mean, not county board of commissioners, the county manager. Okay. That meeting with the city staff to to just see how the county uh, put in. I think it's two point five million dollars. It's always good to meet with the funding agency so uh -huh. you can get a better understanding of how they uh, want that money to be spent or how that money has been elegant to uh you, you know to uh for you to spend it so that meeting would be tuesday okay uh, yeah so there will be additional meeting but uh you know to make sure that we're on track and there was some concern about the uh pwc uh lines uh there and so uh it was suggested then that they go back to the original site. So what yeah. you're saying is there was concern on behalf of the committee as to where PWC's overhead lines were. Yeah. I okay. Mean, they, they have put in some new power lines. So, okay. uh, you know, sometimes government will cooperate with you and sometimes they won't. Just like the art council is asking them, that, well, the theater is asking them to um, put their lines underground. but. Uh, I don't see PwC as being very cooperative. And, uh, and will you be that. surprised if this request is approved? No, I would be surprised. So here's the. Tell me when you can see it. Yes, I see it. Okay, so here's the article about that. Cape Fear Regional Theater wants power lines put underground. So one of the things that I learned, I always thought that underground power lines were the way to go, right? And I still think that they, of course, look better. And there are some positives and some negatives about buried power lines. <clears throat> the po positives are you're less likely for your power to be going out if there's a storm because the lines are buried. The negative is if your power does go out, it's going to take longer to get you up and running because the lines are buried. Tish, you know, I agree with you. But before them lines went underground, they're up somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's the beautification that you put them under. under. Right, right. Remember it's that. all about the aesthetic because power lines are ugly. And so when yeah. you have power lines, and if you think about it, like when we talk about the um, Martin Luther King Park, 
For those who don't know, the objective of the Martin Luther King Park is for them to put up a spire. And so yeah. there will be a spire that that goes from ground level. How high up, Mr. Floyd? Be a hundred feet, but it also depends on the funding. Right. Uh, how much, you, you know, in other words, what, what the cost estimate would be, because you may have to do a a, a revaluation based upon the dollar and the cost. And, but this project has been on the books for a very long time, a very long time. And so <clears throat> the question would be, why wasn't it when the lines were put in, why wasn't that a consideration? Because you would think that given the given the, the, the future plans of that area, that would have been a consideration. Well, you know, when you look at it, uh, you know, PwC, you know, is just like yes, you know, they can just about run the power lines where they want to run. Them. Right. So we see so, here that Fayetteville buried the buried um, downtown's power lines in two thousand, um, and and the cost to put the utilities is estimated at about $3 million. So I guess the question would be, if they're trying to raise $22 million, where would those funds come from? Where would the well, money come from? PwC. Absolutely. Absolutely. PwC. You know, so that's why I'm saying that it wouldn't surprise me that PwC would agree to put those lines on the ground. And then, you know, with the King Park, there was, you know, instead of, the concern was, and the whole up was the line. Uh -huh. So, they committed, then they said, let's go back to the original site because the public want to see some traction uh -huh. in the car than just to continue to talk because there's been $7 million appropriated for the park itself. And, uh, you know, you, you don't want to continue to, to delay it. So, putting it back to the original site, uh, you know, will help speed up the project because you're going to still have to do an environmental impact study right. uh, of, of that project. So then again, you got to deal with PwC, then you got to deal with the environmental impact study, you know, about, uh, you, you know, how much, you, you know, other words, uh, how much it's going, um, what, what would the effect be? be on that creek right so that creek that's a little stream that runs through the uh, park but it's the park itself has uh 17 acres so they but it's close to that creek so you the cost may be assessed with making sure that the footing is proper to maintain that at 100 feet okay so something very interesting has been taking place um, in regards to our activities downtown. <clears throat> we are, most of us who are, have been in Fayetteville for any length of time are very familiar with the Dogwood Festival, Mr. Floyd. And the Dogwood Festival is iconic to the city of Fayetteville and draws people from all around to come in. It's a, it's a, it has typically been a big deal. Um, we saw a few years ago where there was this real push for diversity in the headliners in terms of bringing in more black acts to um, appeal to a different demographic. And we saw that happening over the course of the last maybe four or five years. Well, there seems to be a little drama in <clears throat> in Dogwood Festival land. And Mr. Floyd, I was sharing with you earlier today that this did not take me off guard. It did not catch me off guard because I had been hearing these grumblings for some time, much like with the Arts Council. I've been hearing the rumblings of misappropriation, the rumblings of um, poor management. And now it's kind of come to a head with the Dogwood Festival. And we have two former executive directors of the Dogwood Festival who are embroiled in a lawsuit. We've got. Um, this all playing out on social media. It started off on TikTok. If you want to get caught up on Malia's side of the story. So Malia Allen is a former executive of the, the Dogwood Festival. And she is going after Carrie King and expressing her displeasure with the way that executive director Carrie King has handled um, the Dogwood Festival. She has expressed her displeasure with the way that the city of Fayetteville hired a consultant and the the feedback from the consultant. And I'm going to be honest with you, when I listened to 
and saw the recommendations that the consultant that they paid thirty thousand dollars to to do this study came up with, I felt like she felt like this was a waste of money because it did not even seem to align with the realities of what the Dogwood Festival is about. But Mr. Floyd, they're going at it, and um, there are allegations of threats of violence. <clears throat> There's just it's 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 the perfect storm for the Dogwood Festival. And all of this on the heels of the fact that now the Dogwood Festival is recommending that it be more of a paid event versus just where you can come down and enjoy the atmosphere. So what are your thoughts about all of this playing out as far as the Dogwood Festival? Well, Tish, my relation with the Dogwood Festival was in 2000. When I first started getting involved, I thought it was the most beautiful thing that I participate in and meet people from across the city, county, and state, you know, to express my candidacy. And, uh, you know, you had to do the application form. So I did that and paid the filing, but the filing fee because it asked you, what are you going to be doing? Right. So, uh, you know, as I set up to do that, uh, there was, uh, I think it was Mia Mars, whatever her name was, and Representative Mary McAllister. They came down there and told me that I could not give away free drinks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, siphon cup with ice, uh, you know, the people, you know, to get them to come over to my tent uh, uh, there. And they told me that if I didn't, that they would have me escorted from the activity and that was in year 2000 so i haven't been down to the dogwood festival since 2000 okay and then when i saw the study saying that you're gonna charge that even made me more firm that i will not be at the dogwood festival right and typically the dogwood festival makes their money through sponsorships and through um those permits that they that you know there's there's a process whereby the dogwood festival is able to make their money but according to, you know, this complaint, Malia Allen accuses, <clears throat> excuse me, Kerry King of allegedly stealing $110,000 in sponsorship money, um, accuses her of taking kickbacks from the Dogwood Festival while serving as the executive director, accuses her of bankrupting the, the Dogwood Festival, and says that she was allegedly fired from the executive director position and that King allegedly consumed alcohol or was intoxicated while holding the alcohol and beverage control permit for the festival. Um, listen, Malia went on to say that if this woman was ever in her presence, she could catch these hands. And I, while I know how that feels and I understand the desire to want to let that be known, sometimes you got to keep that part to yourself because that could be considered um, ma making a threat. And when you make a threat, people then have some leverage to be able to come after you and want to file a lawsuit against you. King is being represented by Jonathan Strange. Jonathan Strange is no no stranger to this audience. He has run for office before. We've seen his name on the ballot. Um, he's a pretty good attorney. I think that this is going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out, Mr. Floyd. Well, the, key question, the key question of it is, you know, just like the Martin Luther King Committee, we had to present a, a financial report of our uh, of the committee organization, mm -hmm. you know, financial, uh, a financial picture. So who uh, with these governmental agencies that providing the funding, who asked them to provide a financial picture of the organization so in that the organization a uh, financial report can be audited. Right. I, I don't That's know. I don't know the answer to that question. And I'll say this, Mr. Floyd, I think that audits should be performed of any agency that receives government dollars. I think they should be held to the same standard of audit as the government is held to. Those books should be opened up. They should be reviewed. And we should all get a report at the end of that audit saying what has been found. And I think that, I think if anybody from the Fayetteville City Council is watching, you need to push for that. You need to push for the Arts Council to be audited and not just a basic audit. You need to push for them to have to go through the same stringent type of audit that the city of Fayetteville, Cumberland County, and the state of North Carolina have to go through. 
Well, you know, you mentioned the Art Council. If I'm not mistaken, T.J., so much information. I believe the Art Council gets some money from the hotel occupancy tax or the beverage tax, one of them. They get a little over a million dollars from, from, from that. And then they turn back around and your county board of commissioners do its appropriation journal fund, give them another $60,000 a year. So remember now, they're getting that money, which is a million plus, plus they're getting $60,000 from the county and other funding sources. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money being given of- out. Yeah, yeah. I will be you paying attention that. to this conversation and seeing how it all plays out. I did comment on Malia's um, fate on her YouTube page, and I, you know, I affirmed that I, I will be paying attention to all of this because I think that when we hear often when we hear people raise a concern or or leverage an allegation, folks want to write it off as if that person is just mad. Sometimes we are mad, but we're mad about the fact that folks are being taken advantage of and that things are being misappropriated. So I think that the community would do well to not just write Malia off as a disgruntled um, former employee or former executive director, but I think that they do well to to measure all of this in the fullness of what it really may be. Um, Again, I think that King has hired an excellent attorney. So I think that we should see, um, we should see some resolution to this before it's all said and done. I don't, go ahead. Closing T-shirt. Uh, I don't know how you going to now. Where hypothetical in that teach and you, you, you as a city council. Member. I was, yeah. Okay, now where are you gonna put the gates to collect the money? Well, Mr. Floyd, you know, I think that there are. I I think one of the recommendations, which which again speaks to the strength of Malia's argument, one of the recommendations was to move the festival, the the Dogwood Festival from Festival Park to a smaller venue under the guise of it being um, less expensive and more easy, I think, to control the gate, to be able to actually charge at the gate. But again, it just, it doesn't make sense because as- The piece to you again, T, is that if you have it downtown- Right. With all the streets in there and and you and Larry pay- $10 $10 cash money. Okay. You and Larry pay $10. Who's ordering that John, money? Yeah. And John do come behind you and pay $30 because right. he he himself and a, and a small kid. And then you got Mary James. Now, that's a lot. Of, that, that Please teach whatever you do as it relates to the dog with that. Don't leave people in temptation. Yeah, that would be that would be unwise. That okay. would be unwise. Don't leave them in the temptation. You see, because I'm counting the money. I'm giving you some, and I'm keeping right, some. right. Yeah, so a little be- for you, a little for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I could I could see that being a problem. I don't know, Mr. Floyd, in the grand scheme of things, I don't know how they'd handle that. But I will say I'll be paying attention to, to this because I think that it is. It's the same thing, Tisha, about the parking, you know, where you have designated parking yes. lots. And this is the, the city parking lot that you pay the attendance, right. the money. And the attendant is supposed to give the money to right. the city. Now, remind, now, this is a city parking right. lot. So you have an individual there that's collecting the right. money. I, I hope you understand I what understand I mean. I understand exactly now. what you're saying. And what I hear you saying is maybe it should be cashless. Maybe if we're going to accept money, it should be in a digital currency because a cash-based system does does bring about temptation. You lead in people into temptation. Too. I'm That's honest. All I'm I can take other people's money and be trusted with it because I don't want to. I believe you reap what you sow, but I do recognize that everybody is not like that. Speaking of reaping, everybody, they say that. That's the truth. That's the truth. Now, speaking of reaping what you sow, Mr. Floyd, we've been having a lot of conversations about the E.E. E. Smith conversation about where this school is going to be located. Well, there's a, a real estate investor who has stepped up and said, hey, I've got some land. I'll sell it to you. 
and um, it'll keep the school in the area that you want to keep it in. Now, here's a map of where they, they are suggesting this this plot of land can be. Now, you want to explain to the people where about this is? That's look like it's coming off of Jasper Street. So it's in, this, in the general vicinity of where the school is currently, but it is a relocation. Yes. Now, one of the things that you said was that the, the county needs 30 acres in order to be able to... Right. Now, what I what I saw when I read this was that um, County Commissioner Adams had suggested that instead of building a now, he did not say whether or not he was in agreement with this site. In fact, what he said was at this time, this conversation is not really a high priority for um, the county. <clears throat> right. But Mr. Floyd, he also said in this article that instead of building a traditional layout of a school where it sprawls out, there may be some consideration of building up, which makes a lot of sense to me. Because if you cannot find 30 acres that is sufficient, 15 going up can get you the same amount of space. But it's also then can get you some extra cost. Absolutely. Too, going, going up. Absolutely. You know, so so it's 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 good, it's bad, and it's ugly about uh you know about school development and the way a lot of schools like you said are going up uh there but also there's a lot of the uh, uh building uh activity whatever you want to call right. it that's associated with that school like a football field a basketball court and all not just the classroom itself but for the Board of Education in January to recommend uh, this site at Fort Liberty and the governor coming in and also giving the indirect right for Fort Liberty. Right. And, but the uh, county commission and chairman uh, have not received, at the way Commissioner Adams mentioned, the recommendation from the board of education. Well, if, and if you so look here, Mr. Floyd, there at some point there was conversations about this parcel of land being utilized by the city to do some um some some building affordable housing. Tish, what why do we all want to put now when you hear the word affordable housing, what you know there's certain bugs projects. Words. That's okay. what I hear. When so I hear affordable you know, housing, I hear projects. Houses. I'd much rather hear. So why y'all want to talk about affordable houses than my Right, but now here's the, but here's the kicker. That fizzled out. That fizzled out. But then he said that he went on to reach out. To, he sent an email to the county commissioners, and none of the seven county commissioners or nine school board members had replied. So that says to me, this is not even a consideration for them. Yeah. And then yeah. if you see um right here where it says, uh. Let me let me get to it, Mr. Floyd, because I thought this was very interesting. One of the problems with that whole neighborhood is that there are no kids in the neighborhood, Adam said. The school board hasn't done any redistricting for years. If they don't redistrict, you still have the issue of where do the kids come from? He said the students from Fort Liberty who attend E.E. E. Smith must be considered as well. This is a done deal for anybody who does not think that them moving that that school over to um, striker that striker area is a done deal. This reaffirms that it is because they're saying there's no kids in this area, which I scratch my head at that. But that's very interesting to me. And then they're saying there's no redistricting happening, no conversation of redistricting, which again, I scratch my head because that's a simple fix. And then they're saying that, you know, we have to consider for students from Fort Liberty who attend E.E. E. Smith. So this says to me, this doubles down on we're moving this school to Stryker. What well, one of the things that back some years ago was that once you turn off Jasper Street, off Murkison Road onto Jasper Street, on around to Seabrook mm -hmm. Road, where E.E. E. Smith is located at, there's always been some concern about that two block stretch. Did you understand right. what I it's mean? Kind of, it's 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 okay. been considered um less than desirable when it comes to bringing bringing people outside of that area in. Right. Yes. yes. So, so that's that's somewhat 
you know, uh, an appearance problem that it has long had, especially with the military mm-hmm. community. And so what the county is saying indirectly, uh, 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 Tish, is that, and we talked about this in some of our other uh, programs, that it's not a high priority because the county uh, the chairman said he what? said I'm Civic not really Center. worried about it right this minute he said we've got the performing arts we've got the support center we're still dealing with Grace Creek those are some priorities on the board again let me read it one more time I'm not really worried about it right this minute he said this is a chair- chairman yeah. Adams we've got the performing arts we've got the support center we're still dealing with Grace Creek those are some priorities on the board. He did not name moving that school as a priority. It's not a priority. And then again, if you include it in that priority list, you have to look at how much will the governmental association allow you, how much debt well, they, let they would allow. Yes. Yeah. And that's and that's close to a quarter, a little over a quarter of a of a of a billion dollars. Well, for mm-hmm. projects. Now, Covenant mm-hmm. County has always been very conservative in their project growth. Been very conservative. So I don't see Covenant County uh, carrying that much debt. Right. To add that 60 plus $150 million of, of you know, school. You know, I, don't, I just don't see this county doing right. it. Right. Well, let's talk about this county and the budget of the school, Mr. Floyd. What you need to know about Cumberland County Schools proposed six hundred and two million dollar budget for next year. What were your takeaways when you when you went through this information about the budget? Well, you know, when I looked at it and and and, and I went through it and I saw again where voodoo economics takes Explain place. that to the people and that don't know what that means. That means that you got a hundred position that was funded from federal dollars. A hundred a hundred mm-hmm. position. Knowing that those federal dollars are going to right. run out, it looks good during the initial funding right. process. You bring on these individuals and the and you start functioning with these individuals. Later on, you find out, which is going to happen, that the fu- that the federal dollars are going and to run out. And we see that right here, according to the Cumberland County School Budget Booklet for fixed fiscal year twenty four twenty five. The following positions were funded by ESSER, 31 middle school teachers, 31 social workers, 24 counselors, 21 central services jobs. Now the school system must take $13.9 million from its fund balance to account for these positions and the 92.3 positions lost due to decreases in state funding. So what that's saying is, and Mr. Floyd, again, voodoo economics, because when you take from fund balance, fund balance is supposed to be for one and done. Yes. So what happens so after you, you take from them. fund balance? Because fund balance is like a savings account. It's not a reoccurring funding. So when you take money out of your fund balance, it's spent and it's gone. It doesn't replenish unless you have a mechanism for replenishing it. So how will these positions be funded after it is taken from fund balance? You go back to the county at a higher funding request. To and cover if the those county positions. says no, you lose those positions lose those positions, I mean, which you've already slotted for and already using for your program uh, development. And so that was one of the questions that many legislators had was the amount of fund balance that many school system had and at the same time requesting additional fund from that local government Absolutely. entity is kept fund there their school budget. So see, Con- either- Connolly warned in the budget booklet that taking money from the fund balance won't be a permanent solution. This plan <laughs> is not sustainable for future budget years as the fund budget is only one-time money and creates a significant deficiency if continually relied upon. So it's not it's not a it's not a long-term solution. It, it, it's only a solution for this year. Right. You're gonna to have to add the county to funding in twenty what twenty six physical year twenty six. You're gonna to have to ask the county to to fund it to to fund it at that particular point in time, which is gonna be right. higher than what the cost is now. But uh, they're asking the county, well, I think it's three point five million dollars. Okay. 
but you already got a, a budget surplus of $16 million after you fund these right. positions. So why don't you pull the point you just fund the whole thing? Right. And this has been an ongoing, the conversation about the fund balance has been an ongoing conversation for at least six or seven years because I remember the county board of county commissioners coming to a stall on budgeting because they were having the conversation with the school board. Why are you carrying this fund balance? And the school board kept saying in case of an emergency and the county was saying, if you have an emergency, that's what we're here for. So this has been um, really a, 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 a conversation that continues to play out about this fund balance. I think it's dangerous when you, I know at the city level, we were not permitted to fund salaries out of fund balance because we recognized that that was one and done. And if we were going to create a position, it needed to be something that we had already allocated continual funding for. So I think that's dangerous. I think that when we see that happening, it should give us pause where our school is concerned. I think that Connolly raising the, the the concern should be a red flag as the as the board, as the school board looks at this budget. And if none of the school board members challenge using this this funding for something that is ongoing, that is something where we should all be stepping in and saying, what we should be asking the question, well, what do you plan to do next year or the year after? Well, teach now, I think now don't get me wrong. I think every organization should have absolutely, but it doesn't need to be sixteen million for the school board when you have the county's fund balance that you can tap into in the event of an emergency. Yes. I mean, so you know, so not criticizing the fund balance itself, but the question really How are you using it? Thirty four million dollars. But also, you had to realize that, that I think the county had a decrease in student population. And, and it will decrease year. again this year, Mr. Floyd, because with the expansion of the voucher program, the Cumberland County school system is going to hemorrhage students. Well, well, that too. Uh, and then again, what the public don't realize is that the funding for next school year is based upon your first 20 right. days of student enrollment right. of this year. So so if you had a decline in enrollment, it's going to show in your next physical funding year. So the county got to be prepared for that. And then again, we talked about this I think, program before, is that there were 72,000 people that applied for the voucher right. program. Voucher the program, it says, hey, we have ran slammed right. out of money. I believe that the General well, Assembly the general, will, will appropriate more funding toward that program, though. You know, for the first time, we agree on something. <laughs> you know, for the first time. Yeah, I, I believe, believe they're going to put some more dollars something. toward that program. So those of you who have not been able to be funded yet, just hang in there. Um, I think there's going to be some more money coming down the pipeline. Now, Mr. Floyd, do you think that our schools should be concerned about what do you think they should be concerned about? I guess is a good question. In which respect are you talking about? All of now, the the whole, just suggest. across the board, because I think when we look at the school board and the school system, it has to be looked at in totality. So you really can't isolate, diff- segment out different parts because the whole issue is the issue. I think, I, I think given uh, I think we're about the fourth or fifth largest school system with some hovering around 48 or 50,000 students in 59 and, and 89 okay. schools. You know, there's, a, there's a lot there that the county is providing along with mm-hmm. other services that you have to mention. It. Uh, for instance, at the state level, the state provide about 50 to 58 percent of the state budget goes right. to education. You also got to look at other agencies that have to be serviced by the state. And then, as you mentioned about the school system, uh, the state, too, it, it, you know, is going to require what they call a rainy day right. fund or reserve. Right. The school system and also the county, and which, don't forget now, we are ranked in tier one. We don't have a we lot don't. of cash flow. So, so you so the school system and the county would have to look at how the funding is going to be done. But remind you now, we always is going to have a public right. school system. 
always going to have that. So that means that you have to take what you got and Absolutely. make what you want. Absolutely. Now, now listen, about taking what you got and making what you want, this PFAS conversation has been going on for a long time, Mr. Floyd. We have been, you know, we've been the subject in Cumberland County of documentaries where our, our um, contaminated water is concerned. We have seen that in Grace Creek and, and to, to Commissioner Adams' credit, he mentioned, you know, these are these are the priorities right now, making sure that people have safe drinking water, making sure that, you know, we are not continuing to contaminate our water systems. So we saw the EPA come down. They came in yesterday and made an announcement. Mr. Floyd, talk about the announcement. Well, he was talking about a, a $1 billion grant whatever it is that the federal government is going to provide. And of that, North Carolina gets $29 uh, million from that. But what you had to look at, these forever chemicals teach, was started back in nineteen in the, in the early 1940s. For a trade where the industries had mentioned that we can't tell you what's right. in our right. product because it's trade secret. So this has been going back ever since 19. Uh, the early 40s. Now, when I was on the General Assembly, when the issue first came up in 2017, we had no clue. We didn't even have the, we did not have the machine to measure uh, the amount of uh, chemicals that's right. in the water uh, on there. So one of the things that I said in the Federal Reserve, I think it's a good program, but we don't have the money. So we were able to find I think about $1.9 million after that request was made, so in that we can measure it. But where the meeting was at yesterday, now, please bear in mind now, that was the same location that a textifier company was there that moved from that location to my hometown right. of Rocky Mount. Now, we had to fund every year about $50,000 plus thousand to handle that, uh, that contamination uh, soil and water that was moving towards the PWC mm -hmm. water plant. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a concern there, but finally they are going to be some imprint footprint made. But what the public don't understand is that just like the day mm -hmm. it's cloudy. And if the rain comes, you know, and that air is coming out of those stacks of vents. It follows wherever right. the wind blows and it drops right. down to the ground. And then it gets into our soil and then it gets into our water system, you know, because it's going right. to move somewhere. And water is going to sit, mm -hmm. water moves. So that's the problem. I'm glad that there is a standard, finally, that there is a standard. That's for government, but they also need a standard Absolutely. for industry. This one. Absolutely. And government. and let's be very clear that one billion dollars is across all it's it's from the Biden Harris administration and it's across all of the territories and states that will be conducting this initial testing and treatment at public water systems. So it's not just for the state of North Carolina, but this is a start. It is a start. But Tish, now one thing that back when you mm -hmm. were a little bit younger, the federal government we're just throwing money away, just how many throwing away, just like right. a baseball game. But we here in Cumberland County wanted to be a tobacco road state. So we didn't get this money like Hornet County, right. Sampson County, and Robinson right. County. All of those counties took that money. And they have a county wide system. For instance, Spring Lake gets some of its money from a water water mm -hmm. from Hornet County. Uh, up by Gotland and uh, Wade up that way, some of their water is coming from our Dunn. So, you know, those cities and those towns saw a need for that. Now the county is talking about $161 right. million dollars water down to uh, Grays Creek. Now, and what PWC said, we can run, we can run the water line but to run a water line for two miles and there's no house. Right. You know, right. it's not cost effective. You see. And so we're in a dilemma here 
or even some of our schools that they have to fund. So that's why Commissioner Adam was saying is that these are some of, of our right. projects we got to look at the water system, though we had an opportunity to get water, we just didn't take it. So for those Smith person, you know, you, uh, you know, be concerned about it. But Commissioner Adams, you know, he sort of is the right. head honcho of the uh, uh, county board of commission. So if he said it's not a high priority, uh, Tisha, I hate to say to you, priority. that it won't be, it yeah. won't be considered. Right. At this time, unless there's a drastic change, and so now remind you now, he is a graduate mm -hmm. of Eastmill, and so uh, if he says it's not a priority at this time, and I'm gonna say this so I because know I know that there's mean. probably people who hear that and hear it as a negative, but I'll say this: I believe firmly, Mr. Floyd, that um, government bodies need to be able to recognize that everything can't be a priority. Because that's one of the things that used what to drive me up the wall when we would sit in strategic planning was to hear my peers um, vote everything a 10 in terms of priorities. And I'm like, every y'all, everything can't be a 10. You can really only have one priority because that's the nature of the word priority. Then you go from there and you say, okay, this is secondary. This comes after that. But you got to, you got to be able to really narrow that down well, you know i agree with you on that but teach look at my complexion okay please give me a minority i mean please give me a high priority in 301 i understand okay give me give me a high priority in, in 301 but all these other areas get high priority but 301 Okay, yes, we don't get a thing. high priority. That is why we are segmented by districts because you are supposed to be the pri the the first priority. Let's look at the city council level and the state level. The first priority is your district. That's your first priority. <laughs> so when you come into strategic planning, you should be coming into into strategic planning, really going after what you can get for your district. You need to look at it from a holistic perspective of the entire city or the entire state, but you need to, in your mind, have your district on your mind. And people say that's ward politics, but it's not because Mr. Floyd, and I'm going to use as an example, how I worked my time for the four years that I was there, my priority was my district. And I recognized that the biggest things that my district kept asking me for was sidewalks and streets that, that, that were not raggedy. And so the way that I positioned that was I pushed for an infrastructure bond across the whole city so that we could get more money into my community for sidewalks and street resurfacing. You got to be you got to be strategic, but but there's the ability to prioritize. And I commend Commissioner Adams for being able to say it and say it out loud. That's not that's not a priority right now. We have other priorities. Clean drinking water should be a number one priority, Floyd. But teach now, you know, I, I appreciate your political <laughs> speech. I mean, it, it made me laugh and gave me some yeah. humor for the day. But our elected officials think that they, coming from a district, are uh, actually ran yeah. at large. Okay. They get they, that. No, they serve the, po they serve the pocket. They serve the pocket. Yeah, you see, so my concern is that I didn't run for a statewide, which we have 10 council or state that we call, you know, that elected statewide. T, I did not run for a statewide right. position. I ran in a district. So let me explain to you, T, just like what you said, my district Absolutely. come first and how I negotiate to receive programs and for projects from my district, which is like what you mentioned. But if an African-American representative do that, teach, you will be primary, primary, and primary if you vote outside 
of what the mainstream Democrat thinks. And so I'm just saying this to you so you will know in advance. Don't expect no drastic changes yeah, in the I concept. Know. I know, you unless, you get, unless you elect a different type of person. So speaking of electing a different type of yeah. person, we see something on the ballot coming up that we don't often see. We see an independent candidate that's going to be on the ballot for Congress. This is a win for independents across the board because this is a tough road to 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 hoe. You know, she she had to get signatures in order to get on the ballot, which means that she had to go out and beat feet and she had to get out in the community and convince people that they should sign on with her. I think I'll I'll say this. I think she's still got a hill to climb in terms of getting elected, but she most certainly climbed a hill to get on the ballot. And so, Mr. Floyd, what do you think about the fact <clears throat> that we've got um, Shalane Etchison that's going to be an unaffiliated candidate for North Carolina's 9th Congressional District on the ballot? Well, let me ask you a question, T. You know, does she have a D or R? She has a U. Name. She has a U in her name. Well, uh, uh, when 301 goes to the poll, they are only concerned with one alphabet. Well, they're only concerned with one alphabet. They 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 don't they don't look at who can best who can best yeah. bring the bacon home for them. They're looking at whether or not they have a D mm -hmm. in front of their name. They don't care if you were the Republican in February or you did nothing until now. Yeah, but you know, um, Richard Hudson is a Republican and he has held down that seat for quite some time. And so I think that this shakes things up just a little bit because it does give that third option that so many people crave. Yeah. You're right. I, I mean, I agree with you, Tish. You need to have that option. And just like we talked earlier before we came on the air, you know, when we were talking about looking at the uh, eastern, southeastern part of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of North Carolina, Democrats say we don't even have to go right. over there. They're going to vote Democrat. At the, we don't even have to cross I-95. We know that that population is yeah. going to vote Democrat. So, so you know, we... We don't take the time and look at who can best serve us. And again, Tish, who can bring the yeah, bacon You know, home Mr. Floyd, I think this is this highlights a real problem in our voting process because there are five government approved political parties, and that's the Democrats, the Republicans, Libertarians, mm -hmm. Green Party, and the No Labels Party. <clears throat> our state law says that unless you're one of those five parties, you have to go through a, a, a process to be able to even get on the ballot. I firmly believe that given the, the, the number of unaffiliated registered voters in North Carolina, this law needs to be changed because an unaffiliated candidate should be allowed to just put their name on the ballot and go through the same process that a Democrat or a Republican would have to go through. And if there are two unaffiliates, then they have to go through a primary. And then, you know, this, it should be, this is an unfair law. This is an unfair law. We, we need to, we need to, uh, to have that. Okay. We need to have that. But the system is so locked into what we have. Yeah. Now. Okay. And and for and for uh, a Democrat candidate, just like if you're a white Democrat, right? If you're a white person and if you want to get elected, your best bet is to run as a Democrat. I don't know, Floyd, because these I don't know because these Republicans are are doing some great showings. Well, well, I I I, I mean, Rumorville provides that. In the upcoming election, do you realize that even Cumberland County would have hmm. a pack? Cumberland County. And how would does have that affect? How will that affect things moving forward? Well, uh, it's a lot of Absolutely. money that can flow into that pack. Okay, and that pack can do what it did, 
what it have not done in the past. For instance, you know, when, uh, uh, when you know, like I said to Commissioner Evans when he opted to, uh, to run, uh, uh, well, first of all, I said to him that uh, I think that you are better yeah. as a county board of commissioners. And number two, by virtue of you uh, not agreeing to run against Senator Kirk DeVille, you will not get the PAC money if you ran for U.S. Right. House seat. Okay. So, so when Val Applewhite ran, she got all right. the PAC money. So, uh, I, I don't mean you do it all. Money. So that took away the PAC money from her, Senator Laville. So the question of it is now, uh, will those same PAC give to her? And a PAC, for the people who are watching, a PAC is a political like a action PAC. committee. And so they bring in money and they can yeah. fund um, different candidates without having to directly fund the candidate. Right. They can send out mailers yes. on behalf of the candidate. They can, you know, and the candidate doesn't really have anything to do with it. So the messaging that comes from the PAC is the PAC's messaging. It's not usually approved by the candidate. It's not even run yeah. by the candidate. So often you can see a mailer. And um, if it does not say that this is approved by committee to elect so-and-so, then that generally lets you know that that person didn't have anything to do with that mailer. Well, they can't have any knowledge of right. the PAC. Right. Uh, 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 they well, can't be saying, involved. In other words, yeah, yeah, you see. So that, so that's the point that I'm expressing is that that pack, you know, has a right. endless pocket, of right, per se, and and I think that, for instance, the the Democrat Party have 118 candidates, uh, uh, uh you know, in the 120 right districts across the state. So many of those candidates are just mm -hmm. body candidates. Uh, for whatever reason the person say, I know I'm not gonna win, but I'm going I'm going to foul. Right. Okay. That's the thing. So can the Democrat count on we can't hear you turn yourself on. back up. Okay. Can the Democrats can the Democrats handle the 100 and can it help fund the 118 right. candidates? Right. Well, Mr. Floyd, speaking of speaking yeah, of um, the, the House and the, and, and the Senate, you told me that they're going back in session. September, April 24th. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, they're going back in session to tweak the budget because the budget is a biannual budget. It's every two years. So you have to come back in and look at it. Did we, you know, and that's one of the gauges that they use is not the only one is the December budget because we go all out and spend okay. during December months. And then Ms. Waddell, I hope that you and Larry do the appropriate thing April the 15th is that that's the filing period that your taxes <laughs> have to be in. And they use that. And by the 28th of this month, they will know basically what is the financial picture for the state. And then they will be, be able to then put, to right. put the budget together to see whether or not it's there, it, right. it's over or under, and what a And that's probably and that's, where we'll see some additional dollars thing. going into those vouch that voucher program. Yes, because you can take, you can go, now if the educational chair wants to go right. into that rainy day fund or money projected that came in over, they can move that money into those voucher programs. Now, but my party is going to argue that they need not be any more money right. put in the voucher <laughs> program. Oh, that's a good argument. So why don't you also do an appropriation is look at full appropriation and see how can you right. take some of that rain of day money and move it. But we're going to argue 
about voucher program, uh, which is going to be in effect until we know right. 2032. Yeah. And it's, it's nothing it's you can a, do about it. Yeah. Another debate. <laughs> so, so they will get additional funds. And if it come in high, if the revenue picture come in higher than what they project, then I, I, I for the first time in many months, I agree with you. Oh, Mr. Floyd. Oh, okay, I got you. Um, so listen. So what we should be pay, mm -hmm. what we should expect to see is a and a, some conversations about where they want to put some more money. Basically, when they go into. I was going to ask, are we going to hear about casinos and marijuana? Oh, I mean, teach that revenue thing. I mean, you're talking about jobs. What I hear you talk about all the time. And you I'm and not, my Democrat friends. I ain't friend, that. Y'all keep me out of that. Y'all keep me all the way out of that. No, no, I mean, <laughs> jobs, teach. It's jobs. I mean, you gonna, they going to gamble. We had this conversation before. They going to gamble. They made, I think it's when they first owned what sports betting. I think it was like 27 or but 28. But Mr. Floyd, let me ask you this, uh, because see, we didn't uh, talk about this part. How does how does the fact that a lot of the sports betting is done online affect, because where are the jobs in that for Cumberland County? Well, I mean. Because FanDuel know, is killing somebody, the sports betting game here yeah. in North Carolina. No, Tisha, you're right. I mean, you see, you're right. But it's going to be some jobs somewhere. You know, if they're boarding at this, they may come into my bar. I don't have a bar now, you know, and buy a drink. And then while they're there, they they're was doing, doing that anyway. Y'all, y'all, y'all Democrats got every reason in the book that we should debase our community. And it just, it's not adding up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, when you look at the casinos, I mean, you know, you owe up four casinos. Now, people, I saw, I saw an ad somewhere that they have a bus leaving Fayetteville going. That's up a job. Down, That's a, see, there's a job, a bus. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that forty-eight fifty-five people go. going to going to Danville. So we might well get get some of some of that money and now so you know hey now if there's a casino bill they're going to be food they're going to be hotel they're going to be gas restaurants and everything else that's going to build around that I casino i reserve now, i will not reserve going, now i'm not uh, going to my time. comment until it is a decision made about that because you know where i stand but mr floyd what you want to leave with our audience today because we almost at an hour what well, well, teach I just ask that people be reminded of as we go into it's it's a little bit out. It's please look at all of the candidates that are running for public office right. and vote your choice, whether it's Democrat, Republican, or the person that you mentioned, right. whether you in front of her name. Then vote for a person who is going to right. be an Amazon representative. Yeah. Somebody who will deliver. Yeah, and I'll just say I, I'm gonna, y'all. I just want to feel better. I've been, <coughs> excuse me, I have been, um, just trying to. It's it's so germy outside. <coughs> it's so many germs. So I'm gonna be inside getting better, y'all. If you pray in Jesus' name, pray for me that I get better. And um, know that I love y'all. And Mr. Floyd, I don't want no casinos. And that is the gritty in the city and the word on the curb. <laughs> Listen, and um, I really appreciate more than you will ever know that we get to sit here and do this podcast week after week. And I hope that everybody is learning something and that you're gaining valuable insight. And that at the end of the day, you are able to understand the political realm just a little bit better. So make sure that you like, share, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend, and um, we'll catch you on the next episode.